We are following breaking news in downtown Orlando tonight. We first told you about this tonight on our newscast at 11 o'clock. It appears there's been an officer involved shooting and the scene is now stretching across two of our local communities. It appears as though it's in downtown Orlando by Garland and Washington, where we believe the initial shooting happened. But now we see a second scene over in Apopka. We had such a lull for a very long time, but we've been telling you that the overnight hours were really going to be when things were going to start to pick up. And if you look at our live radar, you could see even though the center and that eye of the hurricane is to the west and still far off the coast of Florida, those outer bands are filtering into our area here. And just look at how far those the whole storm stretches. Hello and welcome to the 2023 Come Out with Pride Parade in downtown Orlando. I am Michelle Imperato. And I'm Michelle Meredith. Oh, Michelle. And together we're oh. the... That we're Michelle's. the Michelle's. <laughs> Sorry, we practiced and I still didn't do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we are having such a great time already today. It is a beautiful, sunny, a little bit windy day here in downtown Orlando, but perfect weather for it, the Pride it, Parade. It really was summer, but before the council approved this measure and the purchase of this property, there was a public comment session that got very emotional. More than 50 people signed up to speak at this session. They were pulse survivors, they were family members, even community members, and you'll hear from them coming up in just a moment. But also, there was emotional debate among the commissioners themselves. West Jews Greg Fox was in the chambers with me, and Greg, at one point it looked like this vote would not be unanimous. No, some unlikely visitors popped up out of nowhere. Two Ooh, raccoons boy. were hiding out in Steve and Shannon Lipkin's boat. Since the Lipkins were in the middle of the lake when the uninvited guests appeared, they were stuck with them. Yeah, yeah. All they could do was keep a safe distance between them. Guys, I would have jumped off that boat. <laughs> <laughs> Once they got back to shore, the stowaways jumped ship, but the Lipkins say it seemed like they enjoyed their ride. Well, good for them. Same time next Saturday, guys. They'll be there. <laughs> Take a look at this video from our West 2 drone over Wilbur by the sea. It shows how devastating the damage was. On the left, you can see what this area looked like right after Nicole. And on the right, you could see what that same area looks like now. And again, so much of this area is still recovering. And as we continue our day long coverage of the one year since Hurricane Nicole, we are going to continue to bring you the stories of the people who were impacted by this storm. So coming up at six, we're going to share the story of a homeowner here in Wilbur by the sea who is recovering. A this woman in Michigan had to be rescued this week after she dropped her smartwatch in the toilet. And this is not just any toilet. This was an outhouse toilet. What did she do? She climbed inside oh, man. to try to get it. She went all in. Oh, she certainly did, Stu. She got stuck and started screaming for help. Police heard the screams and they had to remove the toilet and lower a strap oh. to haul her out. She was in it. We checked right now. We don't know if she was injured. And we're working to find out if she got her watch back. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible to laugh at. Um. Oh, come on. She's crazy. Opening statements and testimony began today in the trial of accused cop killer Othel Wallace. I'm joined in studio this evening by West 2 legal analyst David Haas. And David, let's start with the defense and what we heard today. They're going for self-defense in this trial. Is that something that's difficult to prove when you're talking about an altercation with a police officer? And how do you go about proving that? Well, guys, it depends entirely on who you ask. Some people are happy about today's decision. Some people are not happy about today's decision. Right. Some people just want to get this process moving. Don't forget, it's been a painful seven years yeah. that hasn't seen much progress. So others, though, they don't want to see the Pomas get $2 million for this property. They say some people think that she's already profited enough off of this tragedy. Now, those people who don't want her to get paid also also feel like they have some lingering questions. We brought this up before in our newscast um, about code violations that they claim were present at the nightclub when the Pulse massacre happened, unpermitted renovations that they claim hindered the police response that night. Mm -hmm. Also, they say it prevented some of the uh, victims from getting out of the club. So those are still some lingering questions that they have. And I guess what they've expressed to me is that they're worried if the city does buy it, which we now know they are buying this property, that they would demolish the nightclub and that they would wouldn't get to see for themselves. And some of the mothers who we have spoken to in our investigative process have told us that they would like to go in and see the property mm. for themselves. Right. Um, it, they say it would give them some sort 
of closure just to see what their children went through. And Michelle, now that this is a done deal, what needs to happen going forward from their perspective? So that's very simple and it's a very good question. They want to be included. They want a seat at the table. They want to have a voice in the conversation. They want to be involved in the design plans going forward and they want transparency and they want better communication. Don't forget this happened, this massacre happened on a Latin night at the club. So a lot of these family members, they don't speak English. So mm. this process for them has been doubly painful because they don't always understand what's happening and they're not getting clear communication. This is what they've told us, that what they've expressed to us, that they wish that they had someone who could really speak to them. So that all now falls on the city because they have taken on this responsibility. And I really do feel like they want them to step up and change the way that this has been handled in the past. The city has not said what is going to happen with this memorial going forward, but it doesn't appear as though they're going to play a big role in it. So the foundation, if you remember, was formed by Barbara Poma. She owns the nightclub and she formed this foundation with the goal of building a memorial and yeah. a museum to honor these victims. And so when you take away the memorial aspect, what you're left with is the museum. And from what we have heard is that these families and survivors don't really want a museum. And just think about all of the reporting we've done over the last year. One Pulse has been struggling to raise money for anything. So right. is there still an appetite for this project? What will happen with this? Don't forget, they also purchased land for this memorial. With so they county money. Yes, yeah, yes. That part. So they've taken that step. They've purchased the land. They've paid for designs for this museum. Ten million dollars in TDT tax money that came from the county. So what happens to that? Do they have to repay it or will the county just take that land back from them? Because they were supposed to have this museum open up and running by 2026. Doesn't look good for them right now. So we do want to just mention though, um, Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings did request a meeting with the foundation. So we're going to have to just watch and wait and see what happens and what comes from that. They're starting to see some of the effects in Southwest Florida. This is the Sanibel Causeway. It's in Lee County. And if it sounds familiar to you here in Central Florida, it's because last year when we had Hurricane Ian, we talked a lot about this causeway. It actually collapsed in the hurricane. So they're keeping a close eye on it here. You can see there's some construction vehicles still around the causeway. And that's because it is still under construction and being repaired from when it collapsed during last year's hurricane. So these are the people who are going to be keeping you informed throughout the overnight hour and throughout the duration of this storm. But let's bring in our two meteorologists who we have with us here overnight. So we have Cam Tran and we have Chief Meteorologist Tony Manalfi. So Cam, you have been focusing on really the local impacts that we are going to have here. And we have, we're under a tornado watch in some of our areas through six o'clock in the morning. So we still have hours to go. You have to see this shot. This is a live look at Cedar Key right now where the conditions are quickly deteriorating as Hurricane Idalia gets closer and closer to our state. Yes, Stuart, I think that was a bird. I'm unsure, but that is definitely the picture we were looking at before where the water was rising because that's that same structure that we saw earlier this evening over on the right. It's that home that appears to be on the risers. And we knew this was going to happen. Storm surge estimates have been raised to 16 feet in the Big Bend area where they're expecting this storm to make landfall. So we do know that police first tweeted this out around 11.15 tonight. So that's when we were first notified about this. And the video that we showed you before of the cops that were driving to what we believe is the second scene, that was posted by people on Twitter. People were taking notice of this big law enforcement presence. We do have another crew out in Apopka. So this is West Jews, Dave McDaniel. Dave, what are you seeing around you? We've been watching this unfold, as Jim said, throughout the evening. First, it started with some videos being posted to Twitter. We have that on your screen right here. Different people saw the response to what was happening in the downtown Orlando area, as we said, which was on Garland in Washington. That was the initial stop that you just heard the police chief talk about. Um, and I believe he said it was very brief, but he said they were stopping a vehicle. It sounded like for um, someone wanted in a homicide in Miami. Miami. Yeah. Um, and so that's when the shooting actually happened. But we saw a lot of units mobilizing across the area from different departments. Um, and we do know that there is another scene happening that we believe is involved in all of this over in Apopka um, that um, we believe is connected to the search for this shooter. We saw helicopters up at that scene. We have Dave McDaniel out there. Um, he's gathering some information. But I think, Jim, what was really important to note there with the chief, just the emotion on his face, on the chief's face tonight, you can tell this is a hard night. And we know when stuff like this happens that the law 
law enforcement community really rallies around um, their brothers and sisters. We still have a lot of questions about what's going on, but what we do know is that two officers were shot in downtown Orlando as they were making a traffic stop. They got a tip about a car um, that was wanted in a homicide out of Miami, and now it's just an all-out search for whoever did this. So here's where the parade is going to be. So it's going to step off from the corner of Orange Avenue and Washington Street. It's then going to go a few blocks south to Central. Then it will take a left onto Central Avenue where it will go past Lake Eola Park. Then it'll turn left going up Summerlin and end at Summerlin and Robinson. So if you're wondering where we are in this map, we're at Central and Eola. We're kind of overlooking the parade route. So since we're kind of towards the end of the route, we're not going to see any floats here behind right. us for a little while because right. it didn't take a while when they kick off for them to actually make it to us. But we're going to be bringing you all of the floats live right here on West 2. We have team coverage for you today. Our team is out covering this. So we have Greg Fox at Orange and Central. We have Sanaika Brigettigas at Central and Lake Eola. And we have Sheldon Dutez. He is leading our team in the West 2 Weather Lab, which is decked out along the route. Sheldon, how are you doing out there? All right, so here's what we're gonna do today. Um, we're gonna give you a lot of information, but we want you to just enjoy what you're seeing. All of the people who have come out to celebrate the community today and just be a part of this big celebration. And we're, we're gonna throw a lot of information out at you because we have so many participants. So the, the parade has grown so much. We have 165 groups and organizations that are taking part in this parade today. And we've got 46 floats that are gonna be coming down the streets, which is amazing. And Michelle, 3,000 people are gonna be walking today. And just think on top of that, how many people are lining the streets? They've been lining oh, yeah. up for hours already. Good evening. I'm Michelle Imperato, live in Wilbur by the Sea tonight. And this was one of the areas that was hardest hit by Hurricane Nicole. Sea walls crumbled and sand dunes were destroyed. Some homes were sent crashing into the ocean while others were left dangling near the water's edge. We want to give you a closer look at Nicole's path. It made landfall last November 10th, just before 8 o'clock in the morning near Vero Beach as a Category 1 hurricane. After the Vero Beach landfall, Nicole weakened to a tropical storm as it moved northwest across Florida, with the center passing between Orlando and Tampa. The storm caused flooding and beach erosion in areas that were still recovering from Hurricane Ian, but homes were not the only thing impacted. In many ways, the impacts of Hurricane Nicole lingers for our East Coast businesses, both physically and financially. And some were forced to close, others were forced to make significant adjustments to their businesses. West Chew's Tony Atkins spoke with business owners in Volusia and Flagler counties who say Nicole will be hard to forget. We are back with our coverage of Hurricane Nicole one year later. Nicole was the country's first November hurricane in almost 40 years. And it's a reminder that hurricane season is not over yet. What we're also reminded of was rising home insurance costs within the state impacted many people's ability to start rebuilding, especially after hurricanes, Hurricane Ian's impact about 40 days prior. I'm Michelle Imperato, live in Wilbur by the Sea, and Hurricanes Ian and Nicole caused damage to Volusia County's coastline that was never seen before. And West 2's Marley Martinez caught up with the county's coastal director about the top fixes they've made since Hurricane Nicole one year ago and the big projects that are still coming up. We are just minutes away from finding out if one of us is one <laughs> billion dollars richer in tonight's Powerball drawing. You asked me last night, was that going to be it or two nights ago? Okay, Stu, it doesn't matter that you called that it was going to roll over to a billion. I need you to pick the right numbers for us. Do you think uh, Otha Wallace will take the stand in his own defense? Would that serve him in any way to try to prove it was self-defense? When we heard the state speaking today, they talked about how um, Officer Rayner's gun was still in the holster, the taser was still there as well, that none of that had been touched. Do you think that will make it harder for them to prove their case? One year ago today, 14-year-old Tyree Sampson fell to his death here at Icon Park on the free fall drop tower ride. He was visiting Orlando for spring break from Missouri and the horrific video of his death quickly spread online and it clearly showed Samson slipping out of the harness and falling to the ground. The moments following were pure chaos and today Icon Park looks very different. The ride was just taken down last week and West 2 investigates spent months digging into records following his death, uncovering evidence that the ride 
was not being operated properly. And the information was later confirmed by the State Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Western News investigative reporter and political reporter Greg Fox is also here at Icon Park tonight. And Greg, the seat that Tyree Sampson was sitting in was altered.